Professor Smith, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's just great to be with you, Matt. Why don't we start off with your background? Where'd you start off, sort of the arc of your career and what you're doing now? Well, I graduated from the University of Minnesota with a PhD in political science. And uh, my first teaching job was at GW, George Washington. I was there for five years. So I I took a year off. Uh, I was a, uh, an APSA, American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow, and spent a year working for uh, Speaker Tip O'Neill. Uh, so I spent a great deal of time in party meetings, party committee meetings, uh, sat through the committee assignment process a couple of times, uh, spent a great deal of time on the House floor. Um, I uh, left GW uh, in the mid-80s to go to Northwestern, uh, stayed there a couple of years, but uh, the Brookings Institution gave me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I went back to Washington. Uh, in due course, uh, the University of Minnesota gave me an offer that was going home for me and my wife, and so we left for uh, Minneapolis, and I was there for 14 or 15 years um, until uh, Washington University in St. Louis uh, uh, attracted me to uh, direct a research center that funds research in the social sciences, uh, and I did that for almost 20 years. Uh, I gave that up a couple of years ago, and I'm just a regular professor now, uh, finishing um, a variety of uh, projects and starting some new ones. Uh, all through my career, I've really been a student of the U.S. Congress. Uh, my students, uh, my Ph.D. students have all uh, focused on congressional politics uh, if we have one kind of distinctive angle is that we focus more on the history of Congress and how Congress uh, came to be as it is. Congress is uh, obviously one of the older democratic institutions of the world, and we political scientists like to study how people govern themselves, and uh, members of Congress get to design their own rules, uh, design their own committee and party structures, uh, decide how a bill uh, gets to the point where it's voted on uh, for final passage. Uh, not, the Constitution doesn't provide any of that. And so how Congress has evolved to do those things, the political forces that impinge on members to choose one set of procedures or structures rather than another has been the subject of, of my study and, and the study of many of my, my students. Um, I played with some other subjects. Uh, I, I wrote, co-authored a book on the development of the Russian Duma, uh, pretty much for the same reason. I was interested in how legislative bodies uh, develop. Uh, so in the 1990s, and uh, Congress, or I should say Russia, was experimenting with new institutional forms, and they reinvented their parliament called the Duma. And uh, a Russian politics specialist and I uh, wrote a book on the internal uh, structures and policymaking processes uh, that were put in place during that that uh, that decade. Uh, I like other subjects. I'm now engaged in a project on um, the civic engagement of people with disabilities. Uh, we've all these important changes in electoral rules and voting procedures, uh, making it easier during the um, pandemic to vote, uh, and then uh, all of the conservative drawbacks from that that would have occurred in many states have greatly affected people with disabilities. And they continue to be uh, kind of an underappreciated minority uh, in, in our political system. We focus a great deal on ethnicity and race, um, but and they're, and they're obviously deserving uh, of all the attention that they get. But um, we also have to worry about uh, the 15 to 20 percent of Americans who have a disability that affects their everyday lives and their ability to participate in civic life. So that that sub subject is taking um, more and more of my uh, more and more of my time in um, in the last year or so. So that's my background. Uh, I'm just finishing a book on the development of party leadership in the U.S. Senate, and I'm looking forward to getting that out in the next uh, few months. Excellent. Well, I know you have a wide, uh, wide range of interests as it relates to Congress, and you've published quite widely on the subject. So, you know, maybe we can start off with, you know, the the first question I have is really about, you know, some work you've done on the the post um, passage process, right after the House and Senate both have their versions out there, and how do they, how do they come to conclusion on what's the final version? Um, 
So can you talk us through a little bit about what was the questions, what were the questions that you had about that process and what did you find uh, in your work and, and how does, how has it evolved from, you know, I guess uh, uh, how has it evolved over time until where it is now? Well, uh, that project drew uh, the linkage between two um, developments that were obvious uh, about 15 years ago um, and have become even more dramatic since then. One is the partisan polarization uh, in Congress, and the other is uh, the drop in the number of conference committees uh, used by the House and the Senate to resolve interchamber differences on major legislation. You know, a couple of decades ago, uh, Congress typically would have well over 100 uh, conference committees uh, in any two-year Congress. These conference committees were constructed of a House delegation and a Senate de delegation. Their job was to resolve the differences between the House and Senate versions of legislation. And on almost every uh, important uh, piece of legislation, there were differences that needed to be resolved, and the conference committee was the typical way for doing that. The conference committees were composed primarily, almost entirely, of members from the House committee and the Senate committee that had original jurisdiction uh, over the legislation. So it meant that the, um, you know, the real experts in each chamber were getting together to resolve their differences. Uh, but those conference committees uh, have come into uh, disuse. Uh, in, in recent Congresses, there have been precious few of them, uh, nearly zero <laughs> uh, in the last couple of uh, Congresses. Uh, uh, and even though the number of pages of legislation enacted into law really hasn't changed all that much. So the question was, were these two trends connected? And of course, we really knew they were, but we wanted to, uh, 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 my colleagues and I, uh, develop a more complete argument about the way in which uh, the role of partisan polarization in the policymaking pro process has altered the procedural uh, tactics of, of legislators. Uh, the main story is that uh, conference committees, of course, are composed of members of both parties, uh, and as partisan polarization took hold, the minority party was being excluded for all practical purposes from these conference committees. Even if a conference committee was was held, uh, put together, it was really, if the, if the majority in the Senate was the, of the same party as the majority in the House, um, they would just ignore the minority. They'd have meetings behind closed doors on their own and just bring it to the conference committee uh, as a, a formality to to rubber stamp their 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 decisions. Well, it, it turned out in the long run that um, conference committees greatly complicated life for the majority party, especially in the Senate, because in the Senate, uh, you can filibuster the motion to go to conference and you can filibuster the handiwork of the conference committee. So if the conference committee does devise a compromise version between the House and Senate, uh, that has to be approved by the House and the Senate. In the Senate, it could be filibustered. So going to conference created more opportunities for obstruction, minority obstruction and delay. And it's, it's not too surprising then that eventually the majority party, frustrated with that obstructionism, uh, would uh, look for other ways uh, to resolve House and Senate differences. And over time, they discovered some useful ways. They became sort of normalized so that the committee members who were accustomed to going to conference and representing their chamber in conference, uh, you know, at first they kind of resented the lack of conference committee, but they came to appreciate uh, that if they were really committed to getting the legislation enacted, uh, that they had to circumvent conference committees and uh, that became the norm uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so our, our project and the book that resulted uh, uh, tells that story and then uh, shows how uh, it affected key policymaking areas, appropriations, tax bills, uh, budget legislation, um, defense legislation, uh, and just to illustrate uh, how differences in partisanship across these issue areas uh, produced a different historical pattern in uh, the use of conference committees.
Uh, so it's a it's a it represents a major change. Uh, it is still the case that if you read a, a a high school textbook on how a bill became a law, they will say that the conference committee is about the last major step at which changes in the details of legislation are made. Uh, and that's more or less wrong now. Uh, the world has changed. Conference committees uh, are are seldom used. And when they are used, um, the minority really doesn't participate in any meaningful way. So did anything change in the outcomes of the bills themselves? Were you able to quantify or get qualitative uh, insights into whether there's a substantive difference in legislation passed without a conference committee versus with one? Um, well, you know, it's very difficult to isolate the, the conference committee effect uh, on the substance of legislation uh, because um, uh, so many other things have been changing simultaneously. Uh, the, 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 the initial action by the House and the Senate on legislation before it gets to conference is now of such a different character uh, than it had been in previous decades that um, we can't be sure exactly what the conference committee, the, the decline in the use of conference committees means for the content of legislation. The essential feature here is that uh, the minority party is excluded uh, from the process uh, or more frequently blocked uh, from having a meaningful role in the process at almost every stage of the legislative process. Initial committee consideration, the minority doesn't have nearly the role that they did two decades ago. Uh, floor consideration in the House, it's likely to be a closed rule so that minority amendments uh, are not given a meaningful chance uh, to uh, be considered. Uh, and then if the House and the Senate manage to pass something, uh, there's no conference for the minority uh, to participate. So the unique conference effect is really very difficult to isolate. Yeah, and I would think that, you know, it's probably hard to go back and look at what input the minority had into the legislation in that conference committee and whether you could track that back to an individual minority member, you know, versus, uh, versus well, that's not. Right. That's right. And, you know, um, members have, have adapted uh, to their new circumstances and, from the very start of the process, even in the very earliest stages, uh, they anticipate that there'll be no conference committee and that the ultimate result will uh, be due to negotiations among majority party members of the two houses, um, if the two houses are controlled by the same uh, party. Uh, but the main thing here is that negotiations on key legislation have moved out of the committee system. Uh, they've moved out of uh, the committees initially, and they moved out of uh, committee control at the conference stage and more into party venues uh, with key negotiations being supervised by the central party leaders and less uh, by the committee chairs and ranking minority members of committees. Yeah, great. Well, so, um, and I, I'm assuming that the way you phrase that is you think that's a negative thing, that that there should be minority input along the way and in the conference committees, or do you see it as a, as a positive or as a wash? Um, well, I, I, I think it's, it, it's a great loss to Congress uh, and, and to the nation uh, because you're, you're setting aside uh, the contributions of roughly half of the Congress uh, from, from the process. And, 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 you know, that's a shame. On the other hand, uh, I don't want to be quick to blame the majority party for abusing the minority because the minorities have proven quite willing to be obstructionist and not allow the majority to do anything. Uh, and so you need to have meaningful participation and a, and a commitment on the part of both parties to enacting something uh, in, in order for <clears throat> meaningful minority participation uh, to be tolerated. Uh, at least for long. And uh, that's why it's so closely connected to partisan polarization. Uh, if, if from the beginning of the process, you assume that the other side's primary goal is just to simply block you, um, then uh, uh, tolerating a meaningful uh, role uh, and delaying the process uh, to acquire a wider range of views uh, is something that you just give up on. Uh, and um, uh, so you're your working assumption about the behavior of the other side 
uh, greatly affects uh, what process you choose to follow. And that's that's what's happened here is that the working assumptions of both sides, both parties have have been so altered uh, in the last two decades that um, what we used to sort of call the regular order uh, just can't be observed. N neither majority, neither party as in the majority would would uh, think that it could be successful uh, depending on that regular order. Well, let's move on to another subject since I think we're pretty clear on that one, which is uh, the Senate leadership piece that you've done work on in your upcoming book, of course. Um, and uh, you know, you've already mentioned the filibuster, and it's a, it's an inevitable road to the filibuster anytime we talk about the Senate. So, can you talk through, you know, what what questions have you had about the Senate, the Senate leadership, the filibuster, and what have you found in your research, and and uh, take us through kind of the different moving pieces there. Well, you know, um, a quarter century ago, um, a, a PhD student of mine, Sarah Binder, who's now at the Brookings Institution, uh, and and I began asking questions about um, what the received wisdom uh, was on on the Senate filibuster. Much of that was informed by um, uh, word of mouth and some secondary accounts. Uh, much of it was reflected in the observations of Senator Robert Byrd, who was considered to be uh, the expert on Senate history while he was in the Senate. And he authored, with the great assistance of the Senate historians, uh, a four volume set on Senate history. Uh, and we we were uh, observing in the 1990s uh, an increase in the number of filibusters. Of course, they pale in comparison to what we've seen uh, since that time. But what we saw in the early 1990s was an increase in the number of filibusters. Republicans uh, early in the Clinton administration uh, killed Clinton's first health care uh, initiative with a filibuster. Uh, we saw an increase, uh, really, for the first time, a regular use of filibusters on presidential nominations. Uh, they had largely been spared of filibustering uh, before that time. Uh, and it was beginning to ratchet up even in 1995, 1996. We'd started a book project to see if we could um, put that into uh, proper perspective. And what we found was that there were some views of Senate history that were simply wrong. Um, for example, it was assumed that the Senate always had the filibuster. Uh, and well, it didn't. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it assumed that it always had a rule that that provided for supermajority cloture. It didn't. That was a an invention of the 20th century. Uh, uh, and it was even argued often that filibustering in the last half of the 20th century was a relatively new phenomenon. But there had been plenty of filibustering in earlier decades. So we decided that the, the record need to be um, uh, addressed so that um, the, but there was a there was a key problem with those arguments, and that is that the Senate, as we have it now, or had it twenty five years ago, was as was originally intended uh, by say the framers of the Constitution that the Senate was to be a very different kind of body, uh, and the filibuster was one element of that that they wouldn't have restrictions on debate, uh, and so on, and. It turns out um, that uh, Sarah, my co-author, did a dissertation at that time that demonstrated that much of that conventional wisdom was simply wrong. And she did some of the first work on the on the origins of, of the practice. Um, and uh, uh, it turned, it, the, the story is quite simple. Uh, the Senate uh, enabled filibustering almost by accident. In fact, really by accident. Uh, and by by simply eliminating a rule that was unused at the time, this was way back in the early 1800s, in the first decade of the 19th century, uh, eliminating a rule that the House later used as a way of limiting debate, the motion on the previous question. The, House, the Senate got rid of its motion on the previous question when it decided to pull all of its rules decisions into one document, codified their rules, they just excluded that. 
They didn't even recognize the importance of doing so at that moment. It was, wasn't even subject to discussion uh, on the Senate floor. But decades later, Southerners were beginning to use the absence of a debate limit uh, to delay action uh, on anti-slavery measures. And suddenly filibustering became a way of protecting the interests of the South um, on uh, anti-slavery measures, largely uh, at, at first about the extension of slavery to new states in the Midwest and West. Uh, and, and then we began uh, to hear about filibustering in, in the Senate. Uh, and so it was, it was invented along the way. Filibustering was invented along the way. And as I say, enabled by um, dropping a rule that the House later used to limit debate, but the Senate uh, just didn't, didn't have that rule. Uh, <clears throat> well, and legislators being political creatures are remarkably adept at manufacturing rationales in highfalutin, even constitutional terms uh, for the procedural moves that they make. Uh, and so it didn't take any time whatsoever for Southern senators to start justifying their filibusters on the basis of the uniqueness of the Senate uh, and, and starting to talk about it as the greatest deliberative body in the world and how we needed to allow senators to speak at length, uh, even if that meant long delays in, in getting action on, on legislation or maybe even blocking action altogether. Uh, it was simply justified on, on the basis of, of the need to protect extended debate and the need to protect minority rights. So the framers had of the Constitution hadn't thought about the need to protect minority rights uh, by simply ha by having a supermajority threshold for action. Um, to the contrary, the key framers in the Federalist Papers insisted that the House and Senate would operate by simple majority rule. And the Constitution itself reflects that. There's no mention of, of a supermajority threshold for passing regular legislation. Constitution only mentions supermajority thresholds for treaties and impeachment and a few other causes, but not for enacting regular legislation. So this was a this was a creation of Senate experience of the of the Senate's own decisions about its rules, and so our project laid that out, and that has now, thank heaven, become part of the conventional wisdom that this really wasn't the original framers, and now we hear senators on the floor correcting their colleagues about Senate history thanks to the to the work uh, that that we did. So I, I've always felt that's one of our my my greatest successes is that senators. Um, uh, set aside some of the um, inherited wisdom uh, that uh, simply mischaracterized uh, the Senate's real experience. Legislative politics is brass knuckle politics, and very few procedural um, features of Congress are the result of the goodwill of its members. Most of them are the result of, of uh, hard-nosed politics, and the filibuster is another one of those things. And so what about the leadership component of the Senate then? What, what, are, you, what are you looking at there? I mean, it, typically yeah. it's thought that leadership is weak in the Senate from what my understanding compared right. to the House, of course. And so what, what have you, is, is that also a, a misconception uh, compared to history or you know, what have you found on the, on the leadership side? Well, on the leadership side, things were even more confused. Uh, um, the Senate historical office is full of just excellent people and always has been. Uh, they're, they're, they, they do the nation's work by recording the history of the Senate and, it, and it's extremely important, but they got one thing wrong. <laughs> uh, they had um, uh, followed up on some of the early uh, staff work in the Senate and indicated that the first majority leader of the Senate uh, or minority leader for that matter, turned out to be a majority leader was Charles Curtis uh, in 1924. Uh, the, the rationale for that was is that um, it was the first time in the minutes of either party in the Senate that they found mention of the term majority leader. Um, that's not a bad way to define it, but it but it was just very wrong. Um, it just happened. It was really quite accidental that it was used in 1924. It wasn't that they had adopted a new rule creating the post majority leader. 
it just so happens that the secretary, uh, the senator assigned for keeping the minutes, uh, when they elected a Republican caucus chair that year, uh, happened to indicate that this would be the conference chair and majority leader. Why? Because the tradition had already been well established that the majority party's conference chair was the majority leader. <laughs> so um, uh, my colleague and I, Gerald Gam, who's at the University of Rochester, started doing some background research. And we discovered that, you know, there was a lot of guesswork about who the first leaders were. Um, the, the, that official Senate story about 1924 put it very late. Others put it in the 19-teens or earlier, but none of them were well documented. We learned that um, some basic facts about Senate history um, uh, were either wrong or uh, not yet discovered. And so we decided that we needed to provide um, a, a, a more detailed history of uh, the development of Senate party organization. Um, and when we uh, started to pursue that, we, we discovered that the secondary accounts were, were wrong in many other ways too, or at least incomplete. Uh, uh, now, as social scientists, we want to explain these developments, but you cannot explain uh, the organizational development of, of Senate parties without knowing when the developments occurred, <laughs> uh, because it's the context at the time of development that's critical to your explanation. And if you didn't have the dates right, uh, or you didn't know the dates at all, um, then uh, you just could not have an adequate explanation. And so we started digging in and we, we started uh, realizing that simple things like who was the president pro tem uh, were not accurately detailed in the past, or who was the caucus chairman for the Democrats or the Republicans inadequately detailed. Um, the example of the president pro tem surprises most people. Uh, we know that the constitution provides for a president pro tem, that is the Senate elects someone to preside over the Senate in the absence of the vice president. Um, uh, the modern practice, of course, is that the most senior member of the majority party is elected president pro tem and serves for the Congress, uh, or as long as that senator is the most senior member of the majority party, which could be several Congresses. So Patrick Leahy is the current president pro tem because he's the most senior Democrat, having been elected in the mid-1970s. Um, and uh, Orrin Hatch was uh, before him as the Republican most senior member, also elected in the 1970s. But in the 19th century, they actually didn't read the Constitution the, the way we, we do today. And uh, nobody really appreciated this. It literally was not anywhere to be found, even on the Senate's website, uh, which has... Uh, expansive detail on Senate history, uh, thanks to the great Senate Historical Office. But this one thing they didn't quite have right. They had a list of President Pro Tems. He's a constitutional officer. You'd expect it, uh, uh, the list to be there. Uh, but they had one senator per Congress, sort of like the modern practice. But you know, um, in the 19th century, they read the Constitution to mean that every time the vice president was absent, they'd elect a president pro tem. Every time. So if the president, uh, the vice president was there often, uh, the vice presidents in the 19th century had nothing else to do um, but preside over the Senate. But occasionally they'd be absent. And the Senate each time elected a president pro tem. Most frequently they elected the same senator over and over again because that was a senator who was willing to preside and new parliamentary procedure well enough so that he could do the job. But there were Congresses in which several senators were elected president pro tem in the same Congress. Now you might ask, what does this have to do with party leadership? Well, if you're electing several different senators as president pro tem, you can't rely on the president pro tem to serve as a party leader. There were times in the 19th century when they sort of experimented with making the vice president a more powerful person. And some vice presidents, like Lyndon Johnson, when he was first elected vice president uh, in 1960, thought that he could still retain a leadership role in the Senate. So he insisted on attending the Democratic conference meetings. At first, his colleagues didn't like it, and he was disinvited. <laughs> uh, so in the 19th century, um, and well into the 20th, 
um, they actually thought that they had to elect a new president pro tem every time uh, the vice president was gone. Uh, and of course, uh, in, in due course, in the 1930s, in fact, they started the practice of making the most senior member of the majority party, the president pro tem, and kind of depoliticizing it. Uh, and of course, that was about the time that the vice president uh, really had more duties. And over the course of the 20th century, the vice president became a more important player in the White House, uh, and so spent less and less time in the Senate. But we all know that the vice president, thanks thanks to the uh, January 6th events, the vice president has an office in the Senate. That's where he went when he was escorted from the Senate floor at first. That turned out not to be safe. Um, and so he left the the um, uh, Capitol proper. Uh, but, um, uh, but that's where most vice presidents spent all their time, uh, all the way up really uh, through Hubert Humphrey. Uh, that was their first office. And so, so what about what about the notion of power? So uh, this pro tem thing is interesting. Uh, now, did that position really have any power during all this? Or is this more of a, you know, a, is it more of a ceremonial position? And what about that's the what power dynamics in the Senate leadership? That's what it's become. But during many of these years, especially in the 1920s, when the Republicans were in the majority, uh, factionalism within their within the party affected who they wanted to be presiding. Um, because the, the Senate uh, presiding officer has some discretion uh, about who they call upon to speak next and so on. And, and so the contending factions within the Republican Party, um, the stalwarts of the conservative Republicans versus the progressives of the 1920s, uh, fought over this uh, to some degree. And by settling on a, uh, a nonpartisan neutral rule, just make it the, the, the most senior member of the majority party, they, they, they depoliticized that, that whole process. But we did get away from the leadership story. And the real story is that um, floor leaders uh, of the kind that we know now that simply did not exist uh, uh, until um, really the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the Senate parties were rather small. They didn't need a lot of leadership. Um, uh, committee chairs tended to just simply take their turns managing legislation on the floor. Uh, the majority party uh, did have a steering committee, um, a multi-member committee that would uh, try to set the agenda for the party. But many party caucus meetings were devoted to what we should do next on the floor. Um, they would... They, they, and it would be a, a, a real tussle uh, among majority party uh, members about what the agenda should be. Uh, but there was an amazing development uh, in 1890 and 91. Amazing because it was, it, it, was, um, it, it created the first floor leadership uh, of a meaningful kind. Uh, there was an important bill on the floor. Uh, the South called it the force bill. The North called it the elections bill. It was an effort uh, to enact legislation, Northern Republicans were behind it, uh, that, that would allow federal officials, including federal troops, to enforce election law in the South. What was happening, of course, in the previous couple of decades after Reconstruction ended in the mid 1870s was that all the Jim Crow laws started to be enacted and blacks were being excluded from uh, the voting place. So by 1890, 15 years after the end of Reconstruction, um, uh, the North wanted uh, federal officials to be enforcing election law in the South because state and local officials were not doing it. Uh, or they were enforcing these new Jim Crow laws that heavily discriminated in the view of Northerners uh, in, um, uh, the, in, in a way that contravened uh, the new constitutional Civil War amendments. Um, equal protection under the law. Uh, so um, there was a filibuster of the elections bill. The South called it the force bill. Uh, and uh, the bill was killed by filibuster. In, in the process, um, Senate Democrats who were in the minority uh, had a caucus chairman, Arthur Pugh Gorman from Maryland, uh, a border state, uh, who led the Democratic Party very effectively uh, in, during that filibuster attempt. And while he was chairman of the caucus, that was not a 
uh, the chairman of the caucus generally hadn't been a meaningful legislative leader in the party. That was just a ministerial position. You called meetings and you presided. That was it. Uh, but he became a real coalition leader for the uh, for the majority party or minority party Republicans, Democrats, excuse me. And after that episode, they started calling him the 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 Democratic leader, uh, and they were in the minority. They ended up calling him the minority leader. So through the eighteen nineties. Uh, he came to be known as the Democratic leader and minority leader. When he left the Senate, um, uh, all the newspapers asked, "Who will be the new floor leader for the Democrats?" They he had come to he kind of created this position and had changed expectations uh, about the need for a leader. Well, the Republicans, you know, were in the majority during most of the 1890s and through the first decade of the 20th century. And they just really never had a leader. Uh, they did have Nelson Aldrich, who led a, a gang of four top uh, Republicans who were members of the steering committee and kind of ran the show. Um, but um, Nelson Aldrich, he was just chairman of the finance committee, which had which by far the most important committee of, the, of its time. And they didn't have anybody who was recognized as a, as a floor leader. In fact, Nelson Aldrich couldn't always get his bills to the floor because he'd, be, he'd have to fight with other Republicans for floor time. Well, in 1912, the Democrats managed to pull off uh, the unexpected. They won a majority in the House and the Senate. And suddenly, um, the Democrats, who had now had a minority leader, a, a floor leader for a long time because others replaced Gorman, um, their new leader would be called majority leader. <laughs> uh, it wasn't in, uh, written in any rule, in the party caucus rules or in Senate rules, but it was a an informally recognized role in the party. And you know, now that, that um, the Aldrich crowd was gone from the Senate and the Senate Republicans had a caucus chairman, um, in 1913, they started calling him the minority leader. So in 1912 and 13, we had the first majority of minority leaders. Uh, <clears throat> the Democrats had called, they really had that kind of position informally all along. Now, now, the, now the Republicans were following suit. <clears throat> and it really wasn't until 1924 that the caucus minutes happened to mention this. <laughs> uh, and the Senate Historical Office kind of got it wrong. Um, uh, so we straightened that out. Now, why is that important to a political scientist? Why is it important for someone who cares about the Senate? Well, because the conditions of 1924 were very different than the conditions of 1890 and 91. So if you're serious about explaining why it is that parties um, create new positions, what are the circumstances under which they innovate? Uh, then you need to have the timing right. And um, that's what our new book uh, really is all about, getting the timing right. And, and what we're discovering is that, is that the, the most important environmental actor for uh, a Senate party is the other Senate party. <laughs> it's their competition that drives their innovation. Um, usually it's the minority party or the somewhat disadvantaged party that's most motivated to innovate. Uh, and that's what we see. And if it's successful, the other party copies it. Uh, and so the whole Senate history is, is when periods of intense competition between the party generates the innovation. And then we go through periods of lesser innovation because there's not so much competition. And then it rejuvenates and we see a lot more innovation. In the last two decades, we've seen just amazingly intense competition for control of the Senate. It's 50-50 Senate right now. Um, uh, and the average size of a majority has been about 52 or 53, just ever so marginal. Uh, their majority party status is just almost continuously threatened. And, it, and it, it's bred a great deal of innovation uh, during the last um, uh, 20 years. In the last 25 or 30 years, we've seen party, party staffs grow from fewer than a dozen people to now well more than 50 uh, staffers who are responsible to the central party leadership in the Senate. There's a similar story in the House, and it's due to this intense competition. If it wasn't for the intense competition, the average senator wouldn't want a party leader to become that influential. <laughs>
<laughs> well, that's my next question is really what is this power that this majority or minority leader has? I mean, they can't, they can't, can they dole out committee assignments? Can they get pork? I mean, what's the, what's the whole, what can they do? What's their power? Well, um, leaders like to say that their ultimate power is the power to persuade, but you know, the story is always a little bit um, deeper than that. Um, <clears throat> in the Senate, uh, it is true that uh, the floor leaders are relatively weak. Um, in the House, the Speaker of the House enjoys the powers of the speakership plus the powers assigned to him by virtue of being the leader of the majority party. Um, in the Senate, uh, of course, the majority leader and the minority leader, uh, but the majority leader is not the presiding officer <laughs> and so is making motions from the floor and so has to have the cooperation uh, of his party. Uh, everyone sees uh, Chuck Schumer frequently request unanimous consent that the Senate do this or that. And you also see frequently the minority leader objecting <laughs> to the unanimous consent request. Uh, and then doing things by vote is difficult because many of those motions can be filibustered and it requires a three-fifths majority. And as we just discussed, the majority party seldom has three-fifths of the Senate. Um, you know, in, in the period since 1980, we've had a Senate as large as 60 or three-fifths of 100, um, really only for a six-month period. Uh, Al Franken was was elected uh, uh, back in, uh, uh, you know, at, in the when, when Obama was first elected, and um, but that election was contested, and he didn't get a seat until July. And for that next six months, they had their 60 votes, and that's when they passed Obamacare. Uh, but then Ted Kennedy died, a Republican was appointed to replace him, and they were back to 59. That's been, that's, that's, that's the condition of the majority in the Senate. So what can the majority leader do? Um, well, the, his biggest job is to rally his own party, to see if he can find a strategy to which they'll all agree, so that they can maximize their influence. They can't afford to lose votes when you need super majorities for many things, um, and it's sometimes even difficult to get a simple majority. So rallying his party uh, is by far uh, the activity most important to what a Senate leader does today. Uh, of course, it's important in the House too, where there's a slim slim House majority in recent Congresses. So this is this is um, where you know someone like Chuck Schumer spends you know um, almost all of his time. Both parties have weekly luncheons on Tuesdays. Uh, they use those meetings. They use everyday floor sessions to grab a colleague and have a discussion, off the floor discussions. You know, if you're watching C-SPAN 2 and you see the Senate floor, most of the time the majority leader's not there. The majority leader's back in his office, but he's meeting with his colleagues back in his office uh, for hours and hours of time at a time uh, per day, um, it, uh, nonstop uh, while the Senate's in session. Uh, so that's what he needs to do. His formal powers um, are kind of limited. Uh, the majority leader benefits from the right of first recognition. That is, um, if several senators are seeking recognition at the same time and the majority leader is one of them, the, the presiding officer under Senate precedent will recognize the majority leader. Um, and that gives the majority leader the first, the opportunity to make the next motion. Uh, and that's where his power lies. He can merely make the next motion. So through that, he hopes to control the agenda. But that's not easy because um, many of these motions require uh, that he overcome a filibuster and then he needs to get 60 votes. Schumer has only 50. So it's, 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 it's a tug of war for him. Um, little historical footnote. You know, this right of recognition has been with us only since the 1930s. It's another thing that's an invention of really the modern Senate. So uh, while we had uh, recognized floor leadership starting in the 19 teens for both parties, it wasn't until the 30s that this right of recognition was actually recognized uh, as, a, as a Senate president. And there's some irony there too. Um, the vice president was presiding and the vice president uh, was a former speaker of the house who had all kinds of powers to set the agenda. 
And so when asked uh, by a senator who was complaining that he wasn't being recognized, he said, well, it's been my practice to recognize the majority leader if he's seeking, seeking recognition. And so it was a strange precedent. There was no point of order about the matter. He was just explaining what he had already been doing. And uh, but the Senate has recognized that, and every majority leader will now say that's his really his only formal power is the right of right of recognition. Uh, but then he's got to get his colleagues to go along, and they have all kinds of ways to create problems for him. And is it uh, also the same with the minority? Like you know, recognize the minority leader before the other minority members? Uh, well, actually, uh, the 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 precedent from the 1930s uh, extends to the minority leader. So if either floor party leader is seeking recognition, they'll be recognized before uh, other senators. Um, <clears throat> but you can imagine this, this is um, uh, n n not something that, that, that happens uh, by happenstance. The majority leader has a script for every day and carefully follows that and is, is on the floor when he wants to be recognized. Uh, uh, if the minority leader made a request or a motion, uh, uh, asked for unanimous consent that the Senate do something, uh, any, uh, any member of the majority could object and the minority leader wouldn't get his way. The, in practice, what this means is that uh, on unanimous consent requests, it goes nowhere until the minority and majority leader have consulted with each other and, and agreed about how to proceed. So... It's clear that from the historical uh, work that you've done that, and maybe the tone at least is that, you know, the filibuster in your mind is not, um, isn't, isn't, isn't intended and it uh, shouldn't exist. Right. And it should be majority rule in the Senate. It sounds to me like that's what, where you're coming from. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. Uh, it happened by accident. Uh, senators have come to accept it. Many of them come to appreciate it and like it. So its current status in the Senate is not purely accidental. They've lived with it for many, many decades, and many senators like it. Uh, it's important to recognize that, that um, uh, you know, most senators today um, actually expect to serve in the minority at some point in the future, because that's been the recent history, is, is a change in party control. Uh, happens quite frequently. And so they worry that if they're in the minority, they're going to lose a power to block the majority. But there's more to it than that. You know, in the Senate, um, here's a story. Uh, Paul Wellstone, who was a senator from Minnesota before his plane crashed and he died back in the early uh, 1990s, um, uh, was a new senator. And uh, one day on the Senate floor, he he started to talk. I think an agriculture bill was on the floor. And he was talking about all kinds of subjects, but certainly not agriculture. Uh, and his colleagues suddenly realized that he was talking and talking and talking. He wasn't giving up the floor. Uh, and so uh, the floor leader sent over a note saying, what's up? And while he was talking, he wrote back saying, I need to talk to the FEMA uh, administrator um, on the phone. And the leader did a little checking. And it turns out that there had been a tornado in two that hit two small towns in central Minnesota just a couple of days before. And FEMA, in Wellstone's view, was slow to, to send um, resources to those to help those two small communities. And he wasn't about to give up the Senate floor that afternoon until the FEMA administrator was on the phone saying that help was on the way. So he talked for another hour. Then he got a note from a page that came from the leader and said, the FEMA administrator's on the phone in the cloakroom. And that's when he gave up his filibuster. So he was a member of the majority party. He wasn't actually trying to block any legislation, but he gained a source of influence in Washington by being able to throw a wrench into the works of the Senate. He benefited not as a Democrat, not as a liberal, but as an individual senator. Uh, and there are a lot of senators who do not want to give up the, the extra clout they have uh, by uh, virtue of the Senate's current practices. Uh, even if the other party is the one that's benefiting most uh, from current obstructionism. So it, it creates a drag on reform. 
uh, in the Senate and, and makes it even uh, very difficult for someone like Senator Schumer to even muster a majority for the most modest reforms of the practice. So if Senate is a majoritarian body, right, I wonder about your perspective on, you know, the the idea of of delay, right, or the idea of cost. Why don't we call it cost of passage of a bill, right, yeah. in terms of time or energy yeah. or what have you. Right. And, you know, it seems to me that there's a potential principle here, which is the size of the opposition to a bill. Um, you know, if, if that opposition is very large, it should impose a larger cost to pass the bill, right, than if there's, you know, one uh, one you know one senator opposes versus 49 uh one might come up with a principle that says you know if it's 49 uh they should be able to delay much longer in aggregate uh, versus one senator uh you know he can only delay an hour you know what have you something like that is that principle in your mind still relevant for the senate or is that doesn't matter you know whether it's one senator in opposition or 49 in opposition Majority rule, it should take one minute on the floor to pass. Well, it, it's, it's um, <clears throat> you know, honestly, it's it's probably hard to find the ideal rule that fits all circumstances. You and I could probably talk about some dire emergencies uh, in which it would just be great uh, if a simple majority could act quickly um, and not force days of delay uh, simply to hear out a minority point of view. Uh, even if it's a large minority, um, if it's truly an emergency uh, circumstance, one could have imagined, I don't know, Ukraine's need for U.S. support military weapons tomorrow, or um, Kiev is going to be overrun. Uh, and, and we might say, okay, we need we need to be able to act. Now, we hope that finding a Senate supermajority wouldn't be a problem under those circumstances, but we can't, we can't be sure. Um, uh, I've always favored a reform um, that anticipates exactly what you're talking about, Matt. Uh, along the lines of uh, a reform proposal uh, of Tom Harkin, a, a senator from Iowa from many years ago, he proposed that uh, the Senate start with a, uh, a high supermajority threshold, like 60 uh, or a three-fifths majority, and then uh, ratchet down the threshold for cloture uh, in a stepwise fashion over a longish period of time. Uh, so maybe a few days later, make the threshold 57, and then a few days later, make it 54, and then a few days later, make it a simple majority of 51. Uh, you could make those periods longer or shorter um, based on good judgment, but make them long enough so that, um, you know, that up to a month, uh, at least a couple of weeks worth of debate takes place uh, before a majority finally gets a vote on the, uh, on the issue. Um, uh, in the meantime, um, you could do something that I proposed in conjunction with Harkin's proposal, and that is during each one of those steps, guarantee the minority an opportunity to offer a germane amendment. Uh, so that the minority at each step uh, has a chance of modifying uh, the proposal before they go on to the next step. Uh, maybe that modification is going to be enough to generate the supermajority of the original size required. Um, uh, but guaranteeing the minority an opportunity to participate. So the idea there is to strengthen majority rule as the ultimate principle but uh, to guarantee plenty of time for minority participation, making those steps multiple days in length and maybe guaranteeing uh, amendments once they get into a, a process like that. That might be a different, a better balance than what we're seeing uh, today or have seen historically uh, in the Senate. Um, the truth is, um, uh, we probably can't get to a complicated system like that by using the nuclear option. Uh, you know, this 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 requires a whole package of rules uh, uh, in order to accomplish this. Uh, and uh, the nuclear option is a very blunt instrument. In, in, a, in a sense, the Senate needs a new constitutional convention to reinvent itself. Uh, just among senators, they're reinventing their own rules. Um, uh, where they just sort of rethink 
uh, how they want their institution uh, to run. Um, I think they're a long way from doing that sort of thing. Uh, there are some senators uh, out there who think it would be a good idea uh, for us to just go on a long retreat and redesign uh, all the all the key rules, uh, including Rule 22 uh, on, on the cloture process. Uh, and I think that might be uh, a good idea. But could there be a new trade-off of an enhancing majority rule, but also guaranteeing minority participation? Um, I don't know. It doesn't seem possible uh, with the current crop of senators. So let's move on to another subject, um, which I know you've written about, which is this concept of, uh, I think you called it bedrock values. Yeah. Um, I'm very interested in this notion and uh, how, you know, democracy or a legislature can work when you have common values and then you have uh, non-common values, right? And how you resolve those problems in the legislature. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that, that concept? You know, what, what is it? You know, what questions were you asking? What did you find? Well, the background is, it, it, and it's kind of a contested notion. It's it's not widely accepted, but there are many political scientists who I think uh, very smart people who think that that a, a democracy succeeds um, uh, only if um, there is a level of tolerance uh, among citizens, <clears throat> and uh, and that citizens insist on on, on certain basic processes. Uh, just a commitment to certain very core, very basic democratic values. Uh, and most of us, through our own civic education, kind of know what those basic values are. I mean, we have to tolerate people with a different point of view. We have to be willing to listen uh, to people with a different point of view. We, we have to object to those who try to punish people with a different point. Uh, point of view. These, these are views um, about how just humans ought to interact, uh, even quite apart from politics and government. Um, how should humans among friends or in a family or neighbors um, uh, interact? And, and the, 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 the general idea is that there are sort of core democratic values or bedrock values uh, that uh, people in a democracy must hold at least a significant number of people in a democracy must hold for a democracy to um, to survive. It's 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 a bit of an issue today and in recent years because the feeling is is that in the United States and maybe elsewhere we've we've lost much of that uh, commitment to some of those core values that we've accepted the idea that the means justify the ends um, that. Uh, uh, breaking the law, breaking the rules, breaking the norms in the interest of some larger cause uh, is is acceptable. Um, and the uh, but that runs contrary to the basic idea of democracy. Uh, democracy says we're a, we're a, we're a system of laws that that we agree to certain procedures and we live by those um, we live by those procedures. Uh, and so the question is whether or not humans actually have innately <laughs> uh, certain uh, values and whether there are, among other things, even in our biology, um, uh, things that affect our commitment to those values. Now, most of us understand that there is in humans a kind of a, um, uh, uh, a fight or flight uh, uh, instinct. Uh, do we do we um, uh, run from a danger or do we fight against the danger? Uh, uh, the the degree of tolerance for um, uh, contrary ideas uh, for discord varies a lot from person uh, to person. And what some people who study. Um, biology have found was is that uh and these are people like political scientists working with medical faculty uh have found that things like our biochemistry uh can uh influence um uh, some of these bedrock values our, our core attitudes just how fearful are you the more fearful you are the more you're going to maybe want a leader that puts the object of your the, the, the cause of your fear under control 
um, uh, uh, and it affects your degree of tolerance uh, for people who seem to be in opposition to what you stand for. Um, and so the question is whether or not uh, uh, those bedrock values uh, are measurable and then whether they're really related to real political attitudes. Um, and I think that's an interesting subject. And with the graduate student, I did some exploratory research on that. Uh, and let us the question whether or not we really had a good measure of those bedrock values yet. Uh, but this is an ongoing area of research. And my own view is that there's no doubt that that human biology, especially our biochemistry, the hormones uh, that are pulsing through our bodies, uh, <clears throat> affects uh, how we respond to our environment. That, that, that's just that's just obvious. Um, but does that extend to um, how we respond to our political environment? Uh, and, and that's a more open question. Uh, I think the answer is yes, but just how powerful a force that is. Um, and of course, there are now um, uh, uh, very smart people who are doing re research about the opposite effect. How does the political environment and how angry we get charged on, uh, based on, on, on um, uh, 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 the media that we observe uh, uh, or uh, how opinion leaders influence us, is that affecting how our our, our very bodies react. Um, and and so, you know, we have plenty of evidence now that people won't marry somebody from the opposite party. There's there's a, almost a visceral um, uh, feeling about, uh, about opposite partisans. Well, this is obviously a byproduct of the political environment, but it has, it actually has biochemical <laughs> consequences. So this is an area of research uh, that's, you know, I don't think it's going to end up shaping how, political consultants run campaigns, but uh, or how presidents uh, address the general public, they pretty much know how to do those things already. Um, but as a social scientist, I think it's kind of interesting that there might be um, kind of a biological connection. We've already, you know, we've, we've for decades studied social psychology, uh, and social psychology is entirely about how uh, our social environment affects our personal psychology. And our personal psychology, we realize, is very closely connected to our to our uh, biochemistry. Uh, so there, there are some natural connections here uh, that we've been broadly aware about uh, of for years and years that are now getting serious examination so that we understand in some detail the processes that connect our political life to our biological life. Yeah, I think it's interesting the whole biological connection that you're talking about and how, you know, the the level of fear, the level of um, anxiety in society could change people's, uh, you know, prioritization of values. Because when you talk about values and you say, you know, that people are, uh, what I hear is there's been a change in the relative um, position of certain values, right? So, I value democracy and I value process in the past. I value that above some party ideology. Uh, but now the, you know, the party ideologies have been prioritized above the process uh, to the point where they're, you know, in some ways beyond religious values, right? Because even religious values aren't, don't play out to supersede uh, democratic norms or democratic systems. So well, that's right. It sounds like a change in the relative positioning of values in people's minds. They've they've been now elevated these these party values above what used to be the prime the, the top values, which were process, democracy, uh, institutions, and that kind of thing. I agree, and <clears throat> you know, for the most part, uh, the way to view the mass public, I think, um, uh, is that the mass public over time takes on the values and expresses the values um, and behaves on the basis of values uh, that uh, they absorb from the political environment. Um, much of this is through the media, but the media is of course a very complex thing. Social media has greatly complicated uh, how that, what the contours of that, that uh, information intake um, uh, is for the average uh, person. Uh, so, you know, we don't, so the question of, of bedrock values is whether or not there are core values that humans accept uh, because we're humans, um, that um, uh, evolution has, has, has produced um, a typical human, uh, for example, that is a social creature. 
uh, who wants to live in society, who tends to go along with what the social group wants, that 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 there's evolutionary processes that favor that kind of uh, bedrock bedrock value. Um, but these bedrock values uh, are not necessarily um, so strong that they cannot be overcome by more contemporary uh, political influences by the inflow of information that begins to shape how you perceive that environment, even define that environment. Um, and that that environment has changed radically in the last quarter century. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the talk about we live in information silos, that is, we talk to only people of our own kind, listen to news uh, outlets of our own kind. There's a great deal of evidence to support that that's what's happened. Uh, and it does affect um, uh, one's um, uh, knee-jerk response uh, to uh, the political environment. Yeah, yeah. You know the evolutionary the evolutionary pressures that led to the way we frame all these questions are definitely an underexplored area of science that needs to be pushed further. We're doing some of that work, in fact, with um, uh, with Yale University, looking at the evolutionary history of, in our case, its rights, looking at how uh, you know are there uh, are there evolutionary pressures that led everybody to have some notion of rights, uh, even in very primitive societies? Uh, so we're yeah, at that and, and and that would be ultimately play into the rights question, not necessarily some of the questions you're asking, but but close. Um, unfortunately, I we need, I would like to talk more about that issue. We got to move on because you sure. your, your work spans a lot of areas, and we've we've got limited time. So I want to move on to now to this concept of dimensionality. Um, of the congressional voting. You've done some work on that. Can you talk through what that means uh, and uh, you know, in some of the questions you had there? Well, the simplest way of thinking about dimensionality is is, is, is a one-dimensional world. Uh, and uh, for many people, that's kind of what we're living in right now, uh, where you're you have one spectrum, one dimension, one line, at one end is conservative and one end is liberal. And uh, everyone's lined up somewhere along that line from very conservative to very liberal with some people in between. In a very extremely polarized world, they're all in at one end uh, or the other. And of course, if everyone's either at the extreme conservative end or extreme liberal end, it's necessarily one dimensional because you can draw one line between any two points <laughs> uh, as a mathematical matter. The interesting thing about American politics is that when very sophisticated people were writing about American politics in the 50s and 60s, so a, half a century ago, we thought that um, American politics was multidimensional, that there was no one dimension that adequately characterized the mix of political views held by Americans or by elected officials. Um, sure, there might have been a difference between liberals and conservatives, but there was also a um, and, and that aligned people on some issues. But there were other issues like whether or not we should uh, support agriculture with agriculture subsidies or with quotas or whatever. And that would divide Americans and divide um, uh, elected officials maybe along an urban rural dimension where two people who are both liberal, but one was urban, one was rural would take a different point of view on agricultural issues. And so the alignment of legislators on the agricultural issue was different than the alignment of legislators on a liberal conservative issue. And then we went from issue to issue to issue and found a different alignment of perspectives. So no one alignment captured the mix of attitudes that or preferences about policy that we saw in the electorate or in Congress. We called that pluralism. Uh, and that each issue brought its own mix of interest groups, its own mix of attitudes, its own mix of government agencies, and each little community, each issue had its own little community of interests uh, that were in conflict or uh, working together. Uh, and the alignment of, of attitudes uh, then varied from issue to issue. Now in Congress, what this meant uh, is that uh, two legislators who opposed each other on one issue might be teammates on the next issue. And it would, and, and, and knowing that, um, it would tamp down partisanship because while you might be a Democrat 
and not like the Republican on one issue, on the very next issue, you might have to be teammates. Uh, and then you'd be teammates with another mix of legislators on a third issue. And then there was a fourth. And the mix would vary from, from issue to issue. We call that pluralism. Now, the feeling is that over the decades, since the 60s, we've lost that pluralism, that, that your attitude on taxes might have been, um, didn't predict your attitudes, say, on abortion uh, or on school prayer very well in the 1960s, but it does today. Tell me how you feel about abortion. I probably can tell you about uh, tax increases for the rich. Um, and so it, things have become more one-dimensional, more predictable on the basis of the liberal conservative uh, uh, continuum. Measuring that is kind of tricky. Uh, and we know that um, uh, people who set the agenda, like majority party leaders in Congress, can encourage left liberal conservative coalitions uh, to develop or discourage it um, by what issues they bring up and how they pair issues with each other. So, for example, um, uh, in the um, uh, legislation that uh, Joe Manchin was negotiating with Chuck Schumer here just the last few days, uh, you've got a variety of issues in there, climate change and taxes and health care. And, um, you know, if we if we went back to the 50s or 60s, we'd get a different coalition forming on each one of those separate issues. But today we can say, yeah, there's kind of a liberal position on each one of those issues and a conservative one on each one of those issues. And it's producing um, kind of one dimensional politics that <clears throat> that divides the parties. So one party's on one side and one party's on the other side. But decades ago, each party was had multiple factions, multiple divisions uh, that varied from uh, from issue uh, to issue, and it doesn't happen that much anymore. In fact, we focus on someone like Joe Manchin or Kirsten Sinema because they're so unusual. Uh, but a few decades ago, um, there were many of them. There were many of them who uh, had an opinion quite different from the rest of the party on one issue or another. That's what we mean by dimensionality. Uh, <clears throat> so the question, one question about partisan polarization is, you know, when will our politics become multidimensional again? When will um, the Democrats be divided on some key issues? When will the Republicans be divided on some key issues? Um, uh, is abortion going to be an issue that divides Republicans? Those who are religious conservatives and will be anti-abortion forever, and those who are more kind of economic conservatives who really don't want to make abortion a central focus of the party, and who might be, you know, suburban Republicans who are actually pro-choice, uh, given their druthers, um, and and we're so far from that that it's hard to imagine how we get there. But it's unlikely that we're going to do anything about partisan polarization until we get some uh, fragmentation of the two parties um, and some cross-party coalitions developing, uh, maybe a different cross-party coalition as we move from issue to issue, as, as we had in the 50s and 60s. What about this notion of the parties' uh, control inside the chambers, right, as being a factor here? Because, you know, you talked about process already and about how process changes were made that enhanced this polarization issue or responded to it, but also I'm sure enhanced it, right? Uh, you exclude the minority from conference committees, you uh, alienate the minority from having a motion to recommit. Right. Uh, you know, you, you put a bunch of process in place that could exacerbate this polarization um, you could say, you know, or it's a it's a continuing cycle. You know, you're getting it from the constituents, and then, you know, it's coming in from the outside, and then you're reinforcing it with process within Congress. I mean, what if you, you know, I've always, you know, and I've brought this up on the program previously, which is I'm always amazed by the fact that there are rules in the Congress that can relate that that have any connection to party, right? So, like for instance, even the majority minority leader, in my mind, are, are sort of fictions created by the Congress. Uh, that don't exist in the Constitution. And I'm always amazed that party leaders can make any kind of decision that binds their own party members within the, within Congress, you know, whether it's committee chairs, committee 
um, positions and that kind of thing. So I wonder from your point of view, rule changes in the chambers that weakened this notion of party control Mm -hmm. uh, would have any impact to improve uh, collaboration or middle ground or what have you? Congress can, there's no doubt, the Congress can do things uh, to encourage more um, collaboration uh, between the two parties, or at least uh, among a handful or more of members of the two parties. It doesn't require that everyone be be uh, um, collaborating with the other party, uh, but they can do things. Um, but you know this this partisan polarization is is in part a deliberate strategy on the part of elected officials. We got here um, uh, in part by accident. That is. Um, uh, the South was once one party Democratic, but conservative, and that created diversity among Democrats. And there were plenty of moderate to liberal um, Republicans from the Northeast and Midwest who made that party more diverse. Uh, and so there were both conservative and moderate elements of both uh, of one party and conservative and uh, or moderate and liberal of the other party. And that meant that you could have a variety of mixing and matching uh, that tamped down partisanship. As I was, we were saying earlier, it, it, knowing that you had to work with guys from the other party, maybe in the near future, would tend to tamp down the partisanship right now. And that's disappeared. And it's partly strategic. Um, you know, I, I hate to pin blame on one person, but but Newt Gingrich is more responsible for this than anyone. Uh, so it's partly a matter of strategy. You know, Newt... Uh, uh, advocated uh, a, a partisan polarization. He thought conservatives uh, could outgun liberals in the country, and so the more they emphasized conservatism uh, and and demonized the Democrats as liberals, uh, the better off his party was. And and when they won the um, control of Congress in the ninety four elections, he was given all the credit in the world uh, for doing that. And his his strategy, his proposed strategy. Uh, we even call them the Gingrich senators, uh, took that strategy to the Senate. And the Senate, in many respects, it did more harm because even in the minority, they could obstruct everything uh, and bring the place to a crawl. Um, and we're still living with that. Uh, so if once you're faced with that, um, then what do you do in the majority? Do you just punt and give up? Uh, or do you fight back and try to limit the role of the, of the minority? Uh, so in the House, for example, one of the reasons that we began to see so many uh, restrictive rules um, that limited amending activity on the House floor was that in the 1970s, Republicans were offering anti-abortion amendments to every bill that would come to the floor. Democrats were being asked to vote down their amendments dozens of times every year. Uh, and they got fed up with this. Uh, it took a lot of time and it created, uh, for some of them, some difficult voting records. Uh, <clears throat> but it accomplished no policy changes. Uh, it was for it was purely for electoral purposes. And so they started saying, OK, uh, in order to get an amendment to the floor, it has to be approved by the Rules Committee and it won't be approved by the Rules Committee without the approval of the Speaker, the majority party leader. Um, and, and so that... The, the procedural changes have been part of a um, of a of a, a partisan spiral uh, as each party seeks procedural advantage uh, over the other. And this has happened in the Senate too. So minority filibustering blocks majority legislation. But if the minority is still given an opportunity to offer amendments that they know they can't pass, their only purpose is to score points against the majority. Then the majority says, well, you're not going to let the legislation pass because you're going to filibuster it. But we're supposed to allow you amendments so you can score political points against us in the meantime. So you see how then they offer more and more. Uh, they more frequently fill the amendment tree so that the minority cannot offer amendments. But it's in response to a minority strategy. So so this this has happened in both houses. Um, could you break through that and simply say, you can't do some of those things. You must do things in a way that allows bipartisan participation. 
Um, I think I think they they can do that, but there's no majority party that believes that the minority party will behave. Under current circumstances, that's their problem. The lack of trust uh, doesn't allow them to get to the point where they have a serious discussion about how to do that. You can talk about minor changes, like the House Reform Committee uh, can talk about fixing the IT system of the House, um, and uh, but real changes in fundamental procedure is something is something that neither house has been able to address effectively on a bipartisan basis. I think it comes back a little bit to your concept of bedrock values, right? If they value their party's position uh, and their party above the institution of Congress, uh, then they'll make decisions that benefit their party at the expense of Congress, which is as an institution, which is definitely what the seems to be what's happening, just like uh, right. in the electoral system. Well, you know, Matt, in every democracy, there's the challenge of balancing majority and minority rights, the ability of the majority to govern and the ability of the minority to protect its fundamental interests somehow defined. In our constitution, we try to do that through basically majoritarian principles in the core of the constitution, and then have a bill of rights that protects the rights of the individual, the rights of minorities. And we seek that balance and we accomplish it that way. In legislative bodies, we have the same problem. <laughs> How do we allow majorities to act, uh, but protect minority rights? Uh, and in the case of the US Congress, it's legislators themselves who, who have to determine how to reach that, reach that balance. Historically, the House has always favored the majority, the majority's interests over the minority. In the Senate, they've always long favored the minority interest over the majority by allowing filibustering. But you put a layer of partisanship over the top of that, and the majority begins to crack down on the minority. Uh, and, and that's what happens. In the case of the Senate, though, there's a limit to that. Uh, uh, because in the end, uh, the majority can filibuster, the minority can filibuster. Uh, and even Senate majorities have so far uh, been unwilling uh, to impose simple majority rule for all decisions. They have not yet gone that far, um, in spite of the fact that there are many Democrats and liberals out there who, and yeah, outside of Congress and inside of the Senate, who would like to see uh, the filibuster banned altogether. Uh, but this is inherent in democracy. How do we live with the tension between minority and minority rights and majority rule? Uh, it's something that cannot be resolved permanently in a democracy. It's always going to be a source of tension. All right. Well, I think it's time for us to move on to the questions I ask all our guests so we can someday compare the answers if you're ready for the next phase. Sure. Uh, first one here is... Uh, you know, what do you think congressional representation should mean? And that's your personal opinion. And it's, you know, yep. the judgments versus, uh, you know, versus delegates, um, et cetera. So what, where do you come down on that question? Well, um, I think it's ultimately a, a balance of, 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 of being a delegate and exercising good judgment. Uh, that's unavoidable. But what's critical uh, is that every American have um, uh, a chance of influencing uh, public policy. And we now live in a system uh, where there's such a disparity uh, in state sizes that um, uh, Americans do not really have an equal chance. Um, California is now nearly 70 times as big as Wyoming and they both, both states have two senators. The people of Wyoming have far, far greater representation. Even in the House of Representatives, Wyoming is now, I don't know, about two thirds of the size of an average house district. It's in the 500,000s and the average house district is approaching 800,000. Uh, and yet it has one representative and most of those districts uh, are 30% um, larger. Um, this is a fairly fundamental problem. We can do something about it in the case of the House by increasing the size of the House. Um, say, let's let's increase the size to the size of the, U, of the UK's House of Commons, say to 650. And we would improve that situation with respect to the size of House districts. So that the average House district, we could even establish a law that says that 
the smallest state shall have one house district and every other state shall have a proportionate number of representatives above that. It'd be a simple mathematical solution. The Senate is a far, far more difficult problem. It's becoming less and less representative. Um, uh, the, the, the population differences between the largest and smallest states is, is projected to grow out into the indefinite future. Um, and soon we'll have a hundred to one representation between say a California uh, and a Wyoming. Uh, it may change, maybe um, maybe the modern information society will, will allow us all to move to Wyoming uh, and each of us to have 10 acres of land or something, but, but we're so far from that, that um, it's hard to imagine that in, in the foreseeable future. So when I think about representation and Congress, I see that uh, population um, differential as our most serious problem. Um, uh, we can't even worry about being a delegate or a trustee uh, if if you're not representing about the same number of people as your colleague, it seems to me. And what about the notion of uh, a, a member of the district? You know, do they, in your mind, do they represent the primary voters of that district? Do they represent the... <clears throat> their party in that district? Do they represent everyone? Do they represent 10 generations down the line? You know, where do you come down on what that representation should mean from a district or state point of view? Well, I, I ideally what I would like to think is that each legislator takes the long-term interest of, of, their, of his or her entire district uh, into account. Um, as a practical matter, uh, political incentives uh, don't allow that. And those political incentives shift uh, uh, oftentimes systematically uh, from, from time to time. We're now living in an age where uh, the incentive to pay attention to your partisan base uh, is just overwhelming. Um, uh, it's very difficult to get through a primary in many places uh, today. Uh, so your need to attend to the base, which is probably gonna be at most 40% of your, of your full um, home constituency, uh, is, um, is, is just extremely powerful. So we're seeing that kind of partisan representation strengthened, uh, but representation of people of the other party or of independents uh, seems, to be, uh, seems to be suffering. Um, it's, it's reflected in uh, many aspects of legislators' behavior. When a legislator goes home and chooses which groups uh, to visit, uh, which invitations to accept, these are increasingly uh, uh, decided on a partisan basis. So the, 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 even the informal feedback that they get from, from their constituents now is structured by party more fully than it once was. Many of them have given up on things that we were getting accustomed to, like town meetings. Um, they just don't have them anymore. They, they avoid them. Uh, we're seeing now a trend to avoiding debates uh, so not even putting yourself out in the general media uh, in any meaningful way. Uh, so um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a worry. Um, uh, they're becoming more and more like delegates and delegates of a narrow and narrower and, and more and more narrow constituency. So the next question is, how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? You know, in that, you know, D.C., district, you know, legislation, oversight, dialing for dollars. Well, uh, dollars is a problem. Uh, uh, in, in an ideal world, we would have public financing of campaigns so that the only uh, real question you'd be asking me, Matt, is how they dis uh, distribute their time between visiting with constituents and legislating in Washington. Um, uh, but now the dialing for dollars is, is a very, very time-consuming uh, activity. I, I think most Americans do not appreciate how much of each day in Washington legislators are, are spending over across the street in a party headquarters um, uh, asking for money. Um, you know, we're, we're getting these um, uh, 50 and $60 million uh, races. That's kind of a laugh. Uh, we're now getting hundreds of millions of dollars spent on Senate races if we include the independent money. Uh, and even House races uh, where they're spending um, $10 a voter uh, on their on their campaign, um, and it takes an awful lot of money and an awful lot of of um, well, let's call it foot kissing uh, to uh, get that independent uh, spending going your way. Uh, 
and it's a distraction from both representation uh, and from legislation. Uh, they, they can't possibly spend enough time together to do a good job of doing either. Yeah. So in terms of, I understood about the dialing for dollars. What about in terms of legislation versus back home? Well, it has to be part of the same cloth. There are two threads in the same cloth. Um, your, your, many of your policy ideas have to come uh, from your interactions with constituents, uh, many of whom have all kinds of ideas about how to address uh, problems, and many of them have problems that deserve to be addressed. Uh, and so the more a legislator can spend, more time they can spend meaningful time with, with a, a broad range of constituents, uh, the better informed they're going to be as legislators, the more ideas they're going to bring to the legislative process. Uh, and that's why the the depth of this partisanship uh, that shapes so many of the daily activities of a legislator is so harmful. They just simply generate fewer unique bipartisan or nonpartisan ideas that they can bring into the legislative process because they don't interact with those people much anymore. Uh, it's it's really quite a serious um, quite a serious a threat to uh, uh, to a well functioning democracy. Uh, so I don't really divide the two cleanly, um, but I think the the business of Congress is so large. The importance of having a legislative institution serve as a check on the executive branch um, and be addressing issues that otherwise end up before executive agencies or the courts is is so large that that we need to have a Congress that spends more time in Washington. Um, you know, it's 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 not a half time job now for all practical purposes. If you add up the number of days in session, and it, it ought to be at least that. I I think it probably should be in the neighborhood of sixty percent of of all days, not just working days, of all days uh, should be there. Um, I, I like the idea of 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 uh, work periods and Washington periods. Work periods meaning you're away from Washington. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I wouldn't even mind them doing something in statute to set some general framework uh, uh, for uh, for that kind of thing. But um, the truth of the matter is they've delegated so much policymaking authority to central leaders, a few committee leaders and party leaders, that the average rank and file member figures he might as well be home, where he can do some good in terms of getting reelected. <laughs> or be raising money. And and uh, so this is all of a piece. Um, uh, and, and I'm not sure what to do about that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Next question is, um, how should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? And, you know, should it be in committee? Should it be on the floor? You mentioned already that it's moved to the leadership offices, right? Um, yeah, yeah, but where, where do you think it should be? Should it be back in committees and then they close the doors, you know, and turn off the cameras so people can have real dialogue? What's your perspective on where all that should happen? Yeah, I, you know, th there are some who blame um, uh, the sunshine laws, uh, opening meetings to uh, media and the public uh, for our current condition. That everyone's playing to an outside constituency and legislators are not uh, engaged with each other in meaningful deliberation as much as they once were. <clears throat> I, I think that's a, a part. Uh, I think it's a small part uh, of our of our current problems, uh, because I think there's there are such other powerful incentives that this this isn't uh, the whole story. Um, uh, I, I, I think dictating to legislators um, how they ought to behave with respect to deliberation is is um, um, is a little bit unwise. Um, uh, I think so much deliberation can occur informally that saying it should occur in this formal venue and then that formal venue and then that formal venue, committee, floor, conference committee, um, probably uh, misreads uh, where deliberation goes on. In the mid 20th century, committee chairs developed the habit for important legislation, especially recurring legislation, reauthorizations, appropriations, so on, where the chair would develop what we call a chairman's mark. 
um, it would be the starting point for discussions. But the chairman's mark itself would be the product of informal discussions among the members of a committee. Most of that has been lost. Um, and so I, I, I think that it, th that would be the one thing that I'd like to see reestablished is, is that there be a, this was informally defined, um, never a part of the house rules, never part of a committee's rules. Um, but uh, in both houses, the chair would, even before they met uh, on a hearing, put together a draft of the bill, but the draft would reflect the input of um, all of the members of the committee. They might reject the minority uh, opinion and the minority would have a chance to raise those issues again and mark up as a, in the form of an amendment. But everyone would have had an opportunity to discuss the ideas. A chair could go back to a minority member and say, well, if you tweak it in this way, then I'd be for it. And we'll put that in the chairman's mark. Well, see, that never gets to be a part of the public record that there was that kind of deliberation going on. And that was always the most important form of deliberation that went on. It wasn't the hearing and markup in committee and it wasn't the floor debate or the conference committee discussion. It was that informal process that continues behind the scenes at all stages in the process. So how do we get the minority and the minority, majority and minority to get back together to, to, to that kind of informal uh, discussion? Um, and at the moment I'm stumped uh, because the, 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 the problem right now is that uh, a member of a party who, who seriously consults with the other party is going to be risk being ostracized in their own party. That's the way it is. How many Democrats have said something negative about Manchin or cinema in the last year? I mean, it's, they, they feel that, they feel that. We, I, I learned just yesterday that cinema has not attended many of the policy, Tuesday policy lunches, maybe because she doesn't like people staring at her um, during those lunches. She doesn't want to be the object of their discussion. Uh, so maybe she stays away. I'm, I'm not sure. She may have simply better things to do, but but um, uh, it's it, it's part of the story. So a lot of this isn't cross party. It's each party deciding to be somewhat more tolerant of its own colleagues uh, who work across uh, party lines. There's there's some greater tendency to do that uh, among senators right now than there is among members of the House. And I, somehow I'd like to see that happen, but I don't know how to get here, get there from here. So next question is what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Well, it has to do something about representation. I think the size of the house has to be increased. That's pretty fundamental. They can do that by statute. Um, you haven't changed the size of the house since the 19 teens. Um, it got locked into law in the late twenties. Um, and that was, itself was all, for partisan reasons. Uh, you know, the Republicans decided not to redistrict because in 1911, because it would produce more Democratic districts because um, uh, the country was becoming more urban. And uh, so they punted and then they punted later <laughs> and said, OK, you know, we like 435. It's a nice, solid number. The chamber's full. It Anything larger is too large. But I think the American people, if we're going to have single member districts, if we're going to have single member districts, uh, deserves um, um, a, a larger House of Representatives so that um, there's a better chance that an individual citizen can connect with that legislator. The districts are just not too large. I think if they could be cut, I'd like to see them cut in half, but we will never see the House grow that much. Um, I, I'm, I'm moderately in favor of, I'm, I'm, it's worth thinking about the possibility of uh, a proportional representation in the House. I wouldn't be in favor of it now uh, with 435 seats and so many states with just one representative, there's nothing to apport, set up uh, proportionately then. Uh, but if we grew the size of the House so there were fewer such states, uh, uh, then um, uh, I think we'd have better representation uh, in, in the House. Uh, it doesn't do anything about the Senate. Um, most people do not know that Article uh, 5 of the Constitution uh, 
which provides for the mechanism for amending the constitution has one last clause. And it says that um, there can be no amendment uh, to uh, make unequal uh, the representation of states in the Senate. So uh, that's the one unamendable uh, thing about the constitution. Uh, there's a debate among legal scholars about whether or not you can amend that clause. <laughs> and so it, if so, then it would take two amendments to amend that clause and then uh, to establish a different kind of Senate. I would favor that. I, I like the idea of two bodies. I like the idea of two bodies elected on different electoral cycles. So I don't, I don't mind having a somewhat smaller body elected with longer terms and uh, even um, uh, staggered terms. Uh, but I, I do think that we should move, uh, it, it, that it's increasingly difficult to justify the original scheme um, adopted for practical political reasons of providing equal representation to the states and the Senate. Uh, if, those California are the doesn't, if California doesn't like it, why don't they just split up into like five or six states? Then they'd have equal representation. It would be blocked in Congress. That's why, uh, you know, you, you've got to uh, uh, give each one of those uh, parts of California statehood, and um, and uh, there it, it would be the surest way to generate a filibuster <laughs> is to is to uh, make such a proposal. Um, I'm not sure whether California would support that. They they might. Um, uh, there's a case for that, uh, but then you could maybe at the same time adopt a, a, a general principle that once the state reaches reaches a certain uh, population size, then it must split. Um, I'm not sure that it necessarily makes for the best government, uh, state and local government. Uh, I think it's far better uh, to think about the Senate, which is now directly elected by the people. It's no longer representing state governments, um, that it represents the people and its represent scheme of representation ought to be based on representing people and equal representation. Next question is, what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? Uh, congressional reform. Um, I don't have a real good answer or immediate uh, answer to that. Um, the one discussion uh, that, um, uh, maybe it's two discussions that I've had with senators have affected my ad attitudes about Senate reform. One discussion uh, was with Carl Levin, um, now deceased, a senator from Michigan for many, many years. And one of the senators who opposed uh, the nuclear option and um, was skeptical of really any reform uh, of, of, uh, of the Senate. Um, from him, I realized that there were a handful of senators, and he was one of them, who was a true institutionalist, who thought that really the filibuster or the possibility of the filibuster was just was good for the Senate and good for the country. Uh, so I took that attitude, uh, his attitude seriously. I, I, I also sort of discovered, in part from a discussion with him, that few of his colleagues felt that way, that most of them were really just quite pragmatic about Senate rules, and if they could work the rules to get what they wanted in policy, they'd do it. Um, uh, but they didn't know how to balance competing concerns. They wanted to be powerful individually, and that was something they had to work in the balance. But people like him, Bob Bird might be a close second to him in terms of discussing institutional interests. But the other discussion was with Tom Harkin. Um, he was equally uh, committed to the Senate's well-being and to the country's well-being, but he truly believed that the Senate was was um, running the country off a cliff by allowing uh, a minority uh, to block legislation at will. Um, and uh, at the time he was saying this, uh, the partisanship hadn't reached the fever pitch that it has since that time, but he could see it. It was already a pretty serious problem. And now we have minorities that, um, on the Republican side at least, that make obstruction um, the standard operating procedure it has to be a good reason to allow something to go through. So the burden of proof has shifted completely. 
Um, and Harkin uh, would uh, despise that. But he very much appreciated um, the need in a democracy uh, to give voice to minority interests. And so he then, you know, created that that proposal we discussed earlier um, about forcing the ma majority to take a considerable length of time um, before they could actually get a vote on a matter by a simple majority. And uh, that's kind of a principle, a, a balance that I think um, uh, really fits the nation's interest today. So those two discussions more than any piece of writing. All right, well, the last question is really about your plans. You know, what do you have coming? I know you said you're working on a book and uh, what else do you have on the horizon? Yeah, the book is uh, near completion on the history and development of Senate party leadership. And that, that is going to have some spinoff projects. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that I'm, I'm, I'm engaged in uh, some new work on, on um, um, civic engagement by people with disabilities. Uh, it, just, it just seems to me that my political science colleagues have largely ignored that subject. Uh, we uh, talk about the, um, the gender gap and the uh, race gap, uh, but there's a fairly sizable disability gap. Uh, in voting and other forms of political participation. Um, and I think we're at, uh, our society is at a point where uh, technologically, uh, um, uh, through information technology, there's just no excuse uh, for um, having a disability gap uh, in um, civic participation. So that, that, that motivates me. I'm also very interested, uh, continue to be interested in, um, been working on the Senate for a long time, but in both the House and the Senate, factions are taking a, a more interesting role. Uh, interesting role. Uh, we generally thought about factions as being either a third party, just with a completely different set of interests from the two major parties, or being somewhere in between. Uh, you know, the British model, and, and of course we get these third party uh, groups or these independent candidates emerging saying we need somebody in the middle. But much of the factional activity we've seen in Congress, and we see that at various points in time, is from factions on the extreme, um, preventing a, uh, even a majority party in the House from acting. It 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 you know it led to the demise of Speaker Boehner. Um, it probably um, hurried uh, the retirement of uh, 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 of other speakers, uh, probably even his successor. Uh, and I'd like to do a little bit more on the nature of, of party factionalism. Uh, I think it's un, little understood in the incentives, motivations for organizing, organizing against your, your own party. Uh, it seems to me to be kind of a fascinating uh, subject and ultimately could be the source uh, for challenging the current state of partisan polarization that we see. Great. Well, Professor Smith, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and uh, best of luck with the coming work. Thanks a lot, Matt. Good luck to you. Thank you.